I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. The dark fire will not avail you. The Istari, the five wizards, the apparent old men who are in fact mighty angels. It is well believed that Gandalf was the only one of the five sent to fight Sauron that stayed true to their mission. But what was this mission? What was their purpose upon arrival? Was it always the same thing? Let us look at this today. Remember everyone, if you find this video helpful, informative or entertaining today, please remember to hit that subscribe button below. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on any of our latest videos and you'll be supporting us to continue creating great content like this. The Astari, also known as the Wizards, arrived in Middle-earth during the Third Age, when Sauron's return was really starting to be sensed. Although some do believe that the two blue wizards of these actually came during the second age, but that is a whole topic that we have covered in another video, please check down in the description below for any links for that. But either way, in the third age, Greenwood the Great was becoming Mirkwood after being covered more and more in shadow. The Valar debated on how to deal with this new threat, the one they believed was Sauron without direct intervention, as previous interventions had led to regrets. In this video, we can explore the Astari's original mission and its success or lack thereof. But we have the White Wizard. That's got to count for something. Many things of beauty and wonder remained on Earth in that time, and many things also of evil and dread. Orcs there were, and trolls, and dragons, and fell beasts, and strange creatures old and wise in the woods whose names are forgotten. Dwarves still laboured in the hills and wrought with ancient craft works of metal and stone that none now can rival. But the dominion of men was preparing and all things were changing until at last the Dark Lord arose in Mirkwood again. This is the prelude to the arrival of the wizards and the growing darkness that urged them to take action. Before we dive in, let's set the stage and grasp the events leading up to the wizards arrival though. Evil began spreading, and the Lords of the West faced a difficult choice as they witnessed the world falling into shadow once again. While this passage is lengthy, it sheds light on the challenges the Elves and all the free peoples of Middle-earth endured, helping us understand the position that the Valar found themselves in at that crucial time. So let's embark on this journey to uncover the mysteries of the Astari and the perils that awaited them in the lands of Middle-earth. Now of old the name of that forest was Greenwood the Great, and its wide halls and aisles were the haunt of many beasts and birds of bright song, and there was the realm of King Thranduil under the oak and the beech. But after many years, when well nigh a third of that age of the world had passed, a darkness crept slowly through the wood from the southward, and fear walked there in shadowy glades. Foul beasts came hunting, and cruel and evil creatures laid there their snares. Then the name of the forest was changed, and Mirkwood it was called, for the nightshade lay deep there, and few dared to pass through, save only in the north where Thranduil's people still held the evil at bay. Whence it came few could tell, and it was long ere even the wise could discover it. It was the shadow of Sauron, and the sign of his return. For coming out of the wastes of the east, he took up his abode in the south of the forest, and slowly he grew and took shape there again. In a dark hill he made his dwelling, and wrought there his sorcery. And all folk feared the sorcery of Dol Gordor, and yet they knew not at first how great was their peril. The lords of the west, responsible for guarding Middle-earth, faced a dilemma. Previous direct intervention had disastrous consequences during the Battle of Morgoth by the Valar. The world suffered great destruction, leading the Valar to avoid direct involvement again. So they chose to send the Astari as a safer means to intervene and protect the world they loved. Even as the first shadows were felt in Mirkwood, there appeared in the west of Middle-earth the Astari, whom men called the Wizards. None knew at that time whence they were, save Círdan of the Havens, and only to Alrond and to Galadriel did he reveal that they came over the sea. But afterwards, it was said among the elves that they were messengers sent by the lords of the west to contest the power of Sauron, if he should arise again, and to move elves and men and all living things of goodwill to valiant deeds. In the likeness of men they appeared, old but vigorous, and they changed little with the years, and aged but slowly, 
though great cares lay on them, great wisdom they had, and many powers of mind and hand. Long they had journeyed far and wide among elves and men, and held converse also with beasts and with birds, and the peoples of Middle-earth gave to them many names, for their true names they did not reveal. This was our first glimpse into the backstory of the wizards, including Gandalf, who appeared in the Hobbit book that was published back in 1937, obviously as well as its revised edition in 1952. And if you do want to see about what changes Tolkien made to these editions, we have covered that recently, so please again check the link in the description below if that video may interest you. But anyway, in the Hobbit book, only Gandalf appears, while Radagast and Saruman were introduced later in The Lord of the Rings. However, if you look at the movies, strangely enough, Radagast was featured quite heavily in the Hobbit trilogy, but made no appearance or got no mention in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Unusual, but we carry on. Chief among them were those whom the elves called Mithrandir and Curinir, but men in the north named Gandalf and Saruman. Of these Curinir was the eldest and came first, and after him came Mithrandir and Radagast, and others of the Astari who went into the east of Middle-earth, and do not come into these tales. At that time, Mithrandil, Gandalf, was the most cautious and watchful. While many thought the darkness in Mirkwood was caused by ringwraiths, he feared it was Sauron's first shadow returning. He went to Dol Gordor, and the sorcerer fled, bringing a watchful peace for a time, but a time that would not last, as the tale goes on to say. But at length the shadow returned and its power increased, and in that time was first made the Council of the Wise that is called the White Council, and therein were Alrond and Galadriel and Círdan and other lords of the Aldar, and with them were Mithrandir and Curinir. And Curinir, that was Saruman the White, was chosen to be their chief, for he had most studied the devices of Sauron of old. Galadriel indeed had wished that Mithrandir should be the lead of the council, and Saruman begrudged them that for his pride and desire of mastery was grown great, but Mithrandir refused the office, since he would have no ties and no allegiance, save to those who sent him, and he would abide in no place nor be subject to any summons. But Saruman now began to study the law of the Rings of Power, their making, and their history. With the White Council in place to combat Sauron, Gandalf ventured to Dol Guldur and discovered Sauron's return. He saw news of the One Ring and the heirs of Isildur, Alrond acknowledged that Isildur's choice had allowed Sauron's return. Mithrandir believed that they could still overcome the enemy if they acted promptly though. The White Council was summoned, but Saruman opposed swift action, advising caution and observation. The different opinions set the stage for the struggle against the Rising Darkness. Saruman, or Curinir, had been working against the Valar's mission of combating Sauron and inspiring men to noble and valorous deeds. He delayed the White Council's actions for selfish reasons taking advantage of a time when Sauron was still gaining power. Thus the wise were troubled, but none as yet perceived that Curinir had turned to dark thoughts and was already a traitor at heart, for he desired that he and no other should find the Great Ring, so that he might wield it himself and order all the world to his will. Too long he had studied the ways of Sauron in hope to defeat him, and now he envied him as a rival rather than hated his works. He deemed that the ring, which was Sauron's, would seek for its master as he became manifest once more. But if he were driven out again, then it would lie hid. Therefore he was willing to play with peril and let Sauron be for a time, hoping by his craft to forestall both his friends and the enemy when the ring should appear. The Valar may not be responsible for the failings in the world, as they cannot control the free will of living beings. Only Eru Iluvatar can create spirits like the Feyr given to that of the dwarves. Malkor's desire for the flame imperishable led to his downfall, despite being the mightiest and foremost in skill and cunning among them, as he couldn't possess it since it belonged to Eru and Eru alone. So despite these angelic beings being sent on a mission of good, it wasn't always guaranteed. Leave Sauron to me. In time, Saruman would set a watch upon the Gladden Fields, and discovered the servants of Dol Guldur were already in motion and hard at work on behalf of the Dark Lord's will. The original mission of the Astari has been shown here in the segment of the Silmarillion as we have been looking at, but there are also snippets from the Unfinished Tales as well as Professor Tolkien's letters. From these we can derive a ton of useful information regarding Gandalf and how he thinks of the Astari and the way that they act within the larger story. 
But we are going to focus now on the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien, or more specifically, letter 156 to Robert Murray back from 1954 when he is talking about these things. Why they should take such a form is bound up with the mythology of the angelic powers of the world of this fable. At this point in the fabulous history, the purpose was precisely to limit and to hinder their exhibition of power on the physical plane, and so they should do what they were primarily sent for, train, advise, instruct, arouse the hearts and minds of those threatened by Sauron to a resistance with their own strengths, and not just do the job for them. The wizards were not exempt, indeed being incarnates they were more likely to stray. Gandalf alone fully passes the tests, on a moral plane anyway, he makes mistakes of judgement, for in his condition it was for him a sacrifice to perish on the bridge in the fence of his companions, less perhaps than for a mortal man or hobbit, since he had a far greater inner power than they, but also more, since it was a humbling and abnegation of himself in conformity to the rules. For all he could know at that moment, he was the only person who could direct the resistance to Sauron successfully, and all his mission was vain. He was handing over to the authority that ordained the rules, and giving up personal hope of success. Tolkien continues by saying how, the authority as he calls it, wanted to enhance Gandalf's power as a response to Saruman's failures. Gandalf sacrificing himself was accepted, and thus returned with greater wisdom and strength. He can now command attention and act as an angel in emergencies only. Despite his power though, he mostly still works through others and rarely uses his full abilities. He rescues Faramir twice and forbids the Lord of the Nazgul, the Witch King of Angmar, from entering Minas Tirith. In the end, before he leaves, Gandalf says how he sees himself as Sauron's enemy, and Tolkien adds how he might have also added, For that purpose I was sent to Middle Earth. Here at the end we have the most important statement to be found on the matter, from the author's own writing. We understand that the reason for the Astari, and Gandalf in particular, was to oppose Sauron, nothing else, and he also goes on to write. But by that he would at the end have meant more than at the beginning. He was sent by a mere prudent plan of the angelic Valar or governors, but authority had taken up this plan and enlarged it at the moment of its failure. Naked I was sent back, for a brief time, until my task is done. Sent back by whom and whence, not by the gods, whose business is only with this embodied world and its time, for he passed out of thought and time. Naked is alas, unclear, it was meant just literally, unclothed like a child, not discarnate, and so ready to receive the white robes of the highest. Galadriel's power is not divine, and his healing in Lorien is meant to be no more than physical healing and refreshment. It cannot be. I am Saruman. Or rather Saruman as he should have been. So there we have it. The mission of the Astari was first and foremost one of resistance, to keep the forces of evil at bay, to rouse the free peoples of Middle-earth to great deeds of valour and nobility, and to that end the plan was a success. They were supposed to kindle a new sense of hope in the children of Iluvatar. And despite the other failures, those of Saruman and even Radagast, while the former actively turned against the forces of goodness, the latter lost himself in the glory of the world and his delight in taking part in that world. Gandalf alone was the one who saw the mission through, whereas we have hints that the Blue Wizards were maybe instrumental in the suppression of Morgoth cults in the East, it is questionable to what extent that maybe that is canon, or if this information should just be disregarded anyway. But that's the kind of stuff that you do get from the Unfinished Tales. This is why today I have relied on the Silmarillion to fill in and backdate Gandalf's calling prior to The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Gandalf remains a shining example of what a servant of goodness can do, with the will and the desire to do so. All of the Astari may have originally been sent by the Valar, but Eru still stepped in at the end to really push the message home of that mission. Gandalf was instrumental in the final destruction of Sauron and the threat he posed to the free peoples of Middle-earth, to Eru's children. When Gandalf departed from the circles of the world, it was definitely left as a much safer place for his presence and the time that he had spent there. I will not say do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. 
With that though, it is time for my question of the day, which is, how do you think things would have gone if Gandalf was never sent back as the White? How greatly do you think this would have affected all future events and the domino effect this may have had? Let me know all of your thoughts and theories on this in the comment section down below. And now to shout out our patrons. You guys have been amazing in supporting our short film project. We have got some amazing updates coming soon. We are really making good progress and I cannot thank you all enough. We have the Divine Power tier member of Kevin, the Fire Demon tier member of Nasheath, and the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew, and Hunter. You are all true legends of the Bro Hiram. Finally, I really appreciate your time in watching this video today. If you've enjoyed the content, please consider hitting that subscribe button and the bell icon with notifications enabled so that you will get notified when all future videos are released. Thank you once again for your support, and I look forward to seeing you next time on The Broken Sword.